okay good morning everyone today we will continue with our gallery of medical devices this will be the second part I don't think we will be able to finish today most likely there will be a third part next Sunday inshallah and it will be the last part today the doctor Adina will continue with us please So last time we uh, talked about uh, all the pediatric uh, IV tubes uh, and lines, and then we start talking about all the cardio cardiac uh, devices. We talked about the pacemaker, the defibrillators, the pericardial pacing leads. Uh, we're going to continue. There is um, another type. It's called biventricular pacemaker, and there is another device called biventricular assist device and loop recorders. And I will show you also how to discriminate each one. Uh, last time we talked um, the pacemaker usually with only one or two leads uh, for pacing the heart either in the right atrium or the right atrium or right ventricle. This type it's called three lead pacemaker or biventricular pacemaker. So it consists of a lead that passing through the left subclavian vein into the right atrium and another lead into the right ventricle and another lead that passing through the coronary draining vein into the left ventricle. Uh, so this one will be anteriorly, and the one through the left ventricle will be posteriorly. This patient also have a prosthetic valve called the mitral. I will show you later how to know the each type. Um, this this is the bioventricle based maker. You can see it's slightly smaller in size. It's a new generation, and um, also as you can see, this is passing through the right subclavian into the right atrium, and the other one into the right ventricle, and this one passing also through the veins that are draining from the left ventricle into the left ventricle. This is just to show you how does it look like. Okay, so we said last time that the defibrillator usually has three leads and the base maker has two leads. I forgot to mention that there's something that's called the shock coil. It appears as a thick wire radio opaque, and this is only found in the defibrillators. So if you found yourself uh, with a base maker or any uh, device with three leads and you don't know this is a base maker or a defibrillator just look to this thick radio peak wire and if you see there's a thick wire this is a defibrillator which is responsible for shocking the heart whenever there is arrhythmia while the uh, biventricular base maker they just have, uh, have uh, three leads without any shocking coil because it's responsible for pacing the heart whenever there is bradycardia uh, this is another defibrillator, but this one of, with two shock coils. One of them located here through the subclavian into the right atrial appendage, and the other one will be located in the right ventricle. So this is how you can discriminate between both. There's a device that's called biventricular assist device. Um, basically, this device, uh, it was when it is invented, it was like a bridge or temporary till the patient have uh, cardiac transplantation. Uh, it is a surgically implanted device that takes over the ventricular pump function, especially in patients with severe impaired ejection fraction, for example, patients with congestive heart failure. So as I said, it was first a temporary procedure. Now it was uh, been put in a patient who are unsuitable for cardiac transplant. So what is this device? Basically, this device consists of two cannula, one of them called inflow cannula, and it will be located in the left ventricle, exactly at the apex and the direction of it toward the mitral valve. And it takes the blood from the ventricle into a pumping portion, and then it will be uh, pumping the blood into the uh, outer flow cannula into the ascending aorta. So this is take the blood from the left ventricle to this pump and then going back to the ascending aorta. So exactly it is the function of the left ventricle. The first part of it is radiopic, while the distal part of it, it is non radiopic. So you only see this part. It is called biventricular assist device. Uh, yes, exactly. Yeah. This patient also has uh, a type of cardiac device uh, with the three leads, and from this thick radiopic. You, mean, uh, you know that it is a defibrillator, the three-lead. This patient also having a prosthetic valve, 
as I mentioned, we, I will discuss it in details. So basically, when you see a patient from the ICU unit, usually this patient with the cardiac devices, make sure that you know the type, make sure that you know the pin of each lead, the end of it, and uh, make sure to know the number and the position of each lead, and also the lead integrity. As we said, there is no any fracture, discontinuity, no kinking, no pinching lead. And finally, look for any complication. For example, if there is any dislodgement, if you found any new thorax, you would suspect that there is some sort of perforation or penetration into the pleural surface, or if there is any hard chamber perforation, basically what you will see is that these leads will be either here or here <coughs> overlying the lung tissue. It will be not inside the heart. You should suspect there is some ch sort of chart perforation, chamber yani, of the heart perforation. Okay, this is device that's called loop recorder. Basically, this is um, just implanted under the skin and responsible for recording the uh, cardiac rhythm in patients who are unexplained palpitation and syncope. They don't know why. So this is responsible for recording. So this is how they look in reality. And this is a magnification view, a view for subcutaneous, and this is on the lateral view. It's just because the ECG. Yes. And transmitted maybe via Bluetooth or something like that? Yes. External. They usually put it in the pocket of the patients, but now they it's put like under the skin. Exactly, yes. Okay, I decided to put this one with the base maker. Actually, this is not a base maker, but it resembled the cardiac base maker. This is called a brain stimulators. They usually uh, put it in patients who have Parkinson's disease uh, with uh, two leads or wires. They are directed subcutaneously under uh, the skin of the neck and then going to the brain. We will see images in details how they exactly located. But when you see two devices and with wires going up to the neck, so this is not base maker and you should take further history from this patient. So this is not base maker. And this is how it like, looked like. And exactly it's quite similar. No, no. And you can see that the, the wires are not directed to the heart. Stimulators. Brain it's stimulators. The of the brain. Yes, in patients of Parkinson's disease, I will talk about the details. But when you see this leads going up to the brain, so this is not pacemaker. You should take further history from the patient if you suspect. Okay, now we'll talk about the prosthetic valve. This is anatomical illustration of the chambers uh, of the heart and the valve, you know, that the tricuspid on the right side between the atrium ventricle and the mitral. On the left side, the aorta will be here and the pulmonary will be at the beginning of the pulmonary trunk. And this is on sagittal or lateral view. Uh, exact location, you can see that the aorta will be here. The tricusp will be the most inferior part focus on this and the pulmonary will be the most superior part. Uh, this is how they look. Uh, some of them are mechanical and metallic and some of them are biological type with the three leaflets and two leaflets. Just one note. Mm -hmm. If you, when you examine a patient, yeah. if he has a mechanical valve, mm -hmm. regardless of aortic or mitral or whatever, you hear it click. Mm -hmm. The patient is sitting and he's pop, 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 pop. You, you can't hear it. You can't hear it. Well, the biological one does not click. Mm -hmm. So you can just know the type without even doing any x-ray. Just sit with it. Okay. You will hear it. It's so loud. It's annoying. Yes. Okay, so prosthetic valve. Basically, the best way to determine exactly what type of valve is looking at the lateral radiograph. So I will t start talking about this, and then I will jump to this. When you see... Um, when you face the lateral radiograph, what we will do is that we will draw a line from the carina or the base of the heart toward the apex. And the two, the valve that are located above this line, it will be either aortic or pulmonary. And the one that are located below the line, it will be the mitral or the tricuspid valve. The tricuspid valve usually is more anterior than the mitral and it will be located more anterior and more inferior. The pulmonary, it will be more superior and more superficial, usually here or here. Sometimes it's variable. But the aorta and the mitral is very close to the line, one above and one uh, below. Um, now, on the uh, PA view, you will draw a line from the left arterial appendage toward the right cardiophrenic abscess, uh, recess, sorry. <laughs> yes, mm -hmm. uh, from the left arterial appendage to the cardiophrenic recess. So the valve that are located above will be the aorta, and usually the orifice of the valve will be directed toward the, aor the ascending aorta, and the valve that are below this line will be the mitral, and also the orifice will be directed toward the apex, and also here the mitral will be directed toward the, uh, the ap apex. 
the tricuspid valve it is variable as I said but usually it is more to the right side more inferior and most of the time it will be overlaid by the vertebral bodies um, and the pulmonary as I said it will be the most superior one and the most superficial one so we'll take examples and we will see how we you know for example, this patient, this is a 35-year-old me, uh, male. He had the history of rheumatic uh, fever, and which you know that it's one of, one of the most common causes of uh, valve problems uh, or disease. So he had, you can see, there are two types of valves, this one and this one, and also here and here. So as we said, we're going to draw a line from the left atrial appendage to the right cardiophrenic recess. The valve that are located above and directed toward the aorta will be the aortic valve, uh, and the one that below, directed toward the apex, will be the mitral prostatic valve. Go to the lateral one to make sure that we are right. Also draw a line from the carina or the F base toward the apex. The valve that are above will be also the aorta, and the one that are below, and also the direction toward the apex will be the mitral valve. Now this patient also is having um, uh, base maker with uh, two leads, one of them uh, located at the right atrium and one of them at the right ventricle. But this patient, because of it's having cardi sort, sort of cardiomegaly, is slightly shifted here. This is another example of patient having three valves. So we'll start uh, also, if we, as he said, uh, we draw a line from the left atrial appendage uh, toward the right cardio. Phrenic recess. So the valve, this one is a valve, but it is uh, very transverse, so it looks like a line. And as you see, as I said, the orifice will be directed toward the aorta. So and imagine this is a line drawn from here. And this patient not full in inspiration, so the diaphragm is slightly overlying the heart and he's having cardiomegaly. So we'll and imagine a line from here down here. This one will be the aortic valve, while the one that are below the line will be the mitral. And the one that, as I said, the most right, the most inferior, and most of the time overlying the vertebra will be the tricuspid valve. Make sure, go to the lateral view, as I said, from the carina toward the, toward the bay, uh, apex of the heart. Also, the one that are above will be aorta. The one that are below will be the mitral. And the most anterior, most inferior one will be the tricuspid valve. Pulmonary valve, as I said, will be the most superior and the most superficial valve. This is a specific type for the pulmonary valve. Uh, it's called sometimes a bovine or melody valve. I don't know why they called melody, but it's made from uh, the cow jugular uh, vein, and they are sewed with a, a metallic uh, or a platinum meridium stent. And this is specific only for the pulmonary valves. Um, they are usually located here and here, as you can see, the superior and more superficial. This is the site exactly of the pulmonary trunk. Uh, this is accepted by a catheter. Yes, trans catheter, yes. Intervention, yeah. minimally invasive compared yes. to the others, which are accepted by sternotum, open heart surgery. Okay. Um, okay, this patient also, this is an APF patient. He's having uh, also a metallic uh, prosthetic aortic valve. Also, as I said, draw a line from here, down here. You can see that this valve, which is located here, will be, if it is clear, uh, located above the line, and also the direction of the orifice toward the ascending aorta. This is the aortic valve. Uh, this patient also having, we, as we said in the last lecture, it is intra-aortic balloon pump, which is located here very small. You, you have to focus more. This patient also have endotracheal tube. He have two chest drains. And we talked last time about something that's called swan gans catheter. You can see this wire that's going down here and with a long loop toward the right side of the heart, which is called swan gans catheter. This is the one. I hope and everyone now is able to know this type of catheter. Also, he's having an NG tube toward the stomach. And also, he's having a right jugular catheter, which is located here. So there's a lot of tubes in this patient. So you have to follow each type of a tube. There is something that is called the tracheal stent. Uh, this is how they, they look like, and they located either in the trachea or in the bronchus. Uh, it's called bronchial stenting or tracheal stenting. This is how they look like, radio-opaque two lines, and basically when the patient has stenosis to any cause, for example, a tumor, so they dilate the bronchus, especially for patients who are unresectable tumors. This is another case, uh, patient have empyema, and they inserted to this patient a type of chest drain, which is we talked about last time, called the pigtail catheter. 
with this small cuff and as we said before يعني small effusions empyema small pneumothoraces this is very helpful called pigtail catheter there is another type of stent that's called coronary stent as we all know anatomically that the heart ventricles receive its blood supply from the aorta the left main and right coronary arteries one of the main branches are from the left coronary artery which is called the left anterior descending aorta it is very commonly having atherosclerotic problems so they place a stent here you will see a two radio opaque lines one of them and also this is exactly the location of it so this is stent of the left anterior descending yes okay. and this is how they look like this is a magnified view <coughs> this is called uh, angioplasty, after angioplasty. After angioplasty, after angioplasty, yes. Angioplasty does not leave any radiographic uh, marker. No. But stenting, we will, they will, we will see this. Yes, and also on CT, more obvious. Mm -hmm. You will see a continuous to radio peak lines, not any interrupted. <coughs> you should ask the patient, did you have any stent? Just before. one comment regarding the heart valves. Yes. In practical life, 99% mm -hmm. of the valves you will see would be either mitral, or the aortic. most common, or the aortic, yes. the second most common. So, yani, rarely you will see something like tricuspid yes. or the pulmonary valve. Yes. Most of the times, it's <coughs> mitral, the vast majority. Yes. And maybe sometimes aortic. Aortic. Yes. Just to be on the safe side. Yes, tri yes tricuspid is very rare. Okay, this patient have uh, mediast mediastinal surgical wires and also he's having these two radio peak lines so, uh, at the side of the left anterior descending artery, uh, exactly descended through the interventricular uh, groove and this is the location to radio peak lines. I hope it is clear to you. Okay, from here I will jump to talk about the sternotomy wires. Actually, at first I thought there is something only called sternotomy wires, but I found there is at least four types of uh, sternotomy closer devices. The simplest one, we know it's called the wires. It is stainless steel wires. Uh, this is one of the gold standard uh, switching in case of incision in case of cardiac surgery. This is called a double wire switcher, two wires, and they make a knob in here. Uh, this is by the uh, PA, and this is lateral view, how they look like. And this is by the volume rendered, exactly how they look like. This is also a type of sternotomy stainless steel wires, and this is just different uh, of uh, type of suturing, which is called eight uh, figure of eight uh, suture, but still it is a wires. And this is by the maximum density projection on the CT reconstruction, how they look like exactly at the figure eight. This is another type of closure uh, devices. It's called uh, sternotomy clip uh, staples, and uh, exactly how they, uh, they uh, maximize or uh, approximate the edges of the sternum together through these metallic products. And exactly this is how they look like, and this is by the X-ray, PA, and lateral view. This patient also above and below uh, sterno uh, sternotomy wires, but this is called staples. Something called also sternotomy bands. Sometimes they use bands and also to approximate the sternum, the closure. And this is how they look by the maximum intensity projection by volume rendering, just a simple band uh, as a ring. Uh, lastly, there's something called ster sternal plates, just like the plates they put it for the back in case of uh, uh, vertebral uh, operations. Uh, they also uh, fix it in both sternum and they with the screws and this is illustration and this is how they look like in the AP and the lateral view. Okay, there is something that's called ASD occluder or arterial septal defect occluder. This is how this look like, just two rings with a connection between it and they place it at the uh, opening, exactly at the small ostium secundum ASDs and they place it here at this opening for closing of this defect. So you should suspect this one when you see something, a hollow of a ring or a circle with uh, some radio opaque um, nodes, uh, uh, you should you know, suspect that there's ASD occluder. This is how they look by an X-ray, like um, maybe a flower or shining sun, uh, exactly this location between the two arterial appendages, uh, sorry, two arterium, right and ventricle. 
This is another patient. Look how does it look like two circles or two rings and connection between them. This is more obvious. And this is how it looked like by uh, behavior. By the CT, it is would be more clear, uh, these two. And also here, be very obvious. Uh, there is something that's called minimize procedure uh, with the using of a specific type. It's called um, clipping device. Basically, this device uh, for patients who have uh, also any patient of uh, arrhythmia or a lot of ectopic beads. Uh, basically, they through a thoroscope uh, they made, made an a thoroscope sorry thoroscope they made an incision through the chest wall and they enter directly to the heart and they will cause ablation on this area that surround the uh, left arterial appendage or the left atrium. Uh, they will not ablate the left, the ventricle itself, uh, the, sorry, the atrium itself because they do not want to cause any thrombi. So they will cause conduction block of the area that surround the left atrium and to get rid of uh, any uh, erratic, erratic uh, electrical signals. So this one is the thoroscop uh, thoroscopic um, device. I'm not sure, but I think yeah. usually the left atrial appendage is the part that thrombi form in it. Mm. most of the times. So uh, in case of patients having uh, showering of emboli okay. from the left atrial appendage, mm -hmm. what they do, they go to mediastinoscopy and they just put this thing here. Mm -hmm. uh, the atrial appendage is like, just like the ear pinna. Mm -hmm. It's just bulging from the atrium. atrium. They just clip it. Mm -hmm. They don't cut it, just clip it. Mm -hmm. So the thrombus stay there mm -hmm. and stop uh, throwing emboli. Yes. So that's what I think. I'm uh, they said yes that uh, conduction block in the areas also like the uh, pulmonary veins to prevent around the pulmonary veins. So it will yeah, be it's, a small. It's not electrical. It's yeah. uh, thrombus preventing the procedure. Procedure, right? And this is how they look like, and this is how it looked like by the X-ray. Uh, I think this is the last slide. Uh, something called endovascular coil. It's a very helpful device. And uh, it is minimal invasive procedure. They use it in case of a new uh, IV malformation or aneurysm, for example, in this case, the patient have IV malformation in the lung. So they place it here to uh, uh, close off this sac and reduce the risk of bleeding. As you know that IV malformation sometimes have risk of bleeding and aneurysm at the same time. So they will place these uh, called endovascular coils to close it off and reduce the risk of the bleeding. Now we'll, s if you have time, we'll s also talk about uh, third part, which is called device and stents in adult patients, except uh, of course the heart. So we'll start about what is called aneurysm mal uh, clip. This patient having anterior several artery aneurysm, so he had a clipping of the aneurysm. So uh, through the lateral uh, X-ray of the skull, this is the clip and how that look like by the X-ray, and this is how this is look very small uh, clip. Uh, this is are the clips of the uh, of the removed part of the skull. Also, this is uh, another shape. How does it look like? And you can see how they clip this aneurysm uh, through this device, and how does it look by X-ray? We talk about the deep brain stimulator. As I told you, the this device will be located at the chest subcutaneously. They pass in through the neck, and they will be inserted through the brain as Dr. Ahmed said, into the basal ganglia and patient of Parkinson disease. So basically, they will have um, cause stimulators to modulate the uh, control the centers deep to the surface of the brain and uh, blocking any abnormal, any abnormal signals and also improving the communication between the brain cells. So this is very helpful in patients of uh, Parkinson disease in case of reducing the t uh, tremor uh, and also stiffness. If you've seen a patient with Parkinson communicating with DBS, deep brain stimulation, it's literally magic. Yes. Just look at it on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. Uh, they are just shaking all over, and when they start, they stop. Yes. It's very helpful, normal. especially for it's the tremor. Amazing. Thing. He will still have some sort of rigidity, but the tremor, yeah, is very annoying and uh, affects his whole life. So it's really, very, as you said, magic. <coughs> so also, this is how they place it, and then directly to the brain. Okay, uh, NG tube, uh, we all know that the NG tube will be located through the nose and the stomach, and the tip should be uh, 10 centimeter distal to the gastroesophageal junction, and this is how they look like. Um, 
there's something that's called gastrostomy a tube uh, so they place it uh, subcutaneously uh, percutaneous gastrostomy tube that has injected a contrast so uh, you can see that the contrast have been put in this um, a tube and then the contrast passing through the, uh, the stomach into the duodenum so this is how they look like and this is the balloon when they insert it they will inflate this balloon so that will be fixed inside in patient they who cannot introduce it through the stomach uh, through the nose sorry if the patient cannot eat also they put this gastrostomy tube through the skin yes. to inject food yes through the tube into yes. the stomach to maintain nutrition yes and you can obviously see here this is the balloon that they use it's just like a folic catheter some sort of yes this is the balloon here to occlude to make it stop fix there. it at sight yes. yes. Uh, also, uh, this patient have a gastrojejunostomy tube. Uh, the the tube have been reaching into uh, the jejunum. Also, this is very important when they need for in feeding the patients. So you can see this tube also subcutaneously located, and then they insert it through the stomach, and it will be passed to the jejunum usually at the left upper part uh, for feeding the patient. Also, this patient having an NG tube, which is from the nose to the stomach, but this one is called gastrojejunostomy tube, also subcutaneously, uh, sorry, from here to here. It's the same, but it's more longer diameter. Uh, double J stand also, they use it very uh, common in uh, urologists. Uh, basically, it's a tube that consists of uh, two endings that uh, in a circle or uh, Coil. coiled. I fix it. One of them it will be in the pelvis, and one of them will in the, the bladder. And it is of a different length, uh, from 24 to 30 centimeters. This is how they look like. And it's important to see the get beginning and the end of this uh, stent. Sometimes because sometimes it can be fractured or dislodged, which is very important. We will see examples. So, for example, this patient, uh, he had placed uh, double J stent before 18 months. And uh, we saw that he's still having a dilatation uh, in the kidney after uh, giving contrast to this patient. And we see the proximal part, but we don't see the distal part. Actually, we see some sort of stent in here. So when they took an X-ray for the pelvis, we've, they found that the, uh, the forgotten or the fractured part is located in here. Uh, this patient also uh, had a double J stent, uh, but uh, uh, when they put it at first, uh, it was a trial procedure, the pa patient didn't have any problems, but later on, after a few weeks, he started to develop a fever and a flank pain, and when they do an x-ray, this is by native and this is by contrast, they found this area with uh, less enhancement and some sort of striations, and he had pyonephritis from double J stenting. When, when you are trying to view a double J stent, whether it's in position, if it's related to any stones or an evaluation of double J stent, always try to at least look at the bone window. It will be very beneficial yes. in showing the double J in continuity, and it will show you the relation between the double J and the stones, if there's any adjacent or nearby stones. Mm -hmm. Bone window is very uh, important here. Yes. As you can see, this is continuous line, and this is by native. Um, also, this patient have bilateral double J stents, you can see. And also, he's having a feeding tube. A feeding tube, actually, it's um, a type of uh, nasogastric tube, but it is, will be longer. And they use it in some patients, uh, and it's passing from the duodenum, reaching the duodenum. So this is not any yani, misplacement or abnormal NG tube location. Uh, this is a feeding tube also. By the ultrasound, I think most of us see uh, how they look like, two radio peak lines, and um, in, the, in the ureter, uh, in the two ureter, ecogenic lines. Two ecogenic lines, sorry. Two ecogenic lines in the pelvis and also in the bladder, if we see another image. There's also something that's called nephrostomy catheter. Uh, they place it, uh, patient who have, uh, they cannot put uh, uh, double J stent, uh, or in any patient who have some sort of obstruction, through the skin and with a pigtail or coil ending also to fix it inside. It's called nephrostomy tube and this is how they look in the reality and this is how they, they look by the x-ray. Uh, 
uh, supra pubic catheter i think most of us also saw it uh, this is the supra pubic catheter they inserted uh, just below the umbilicus this is dilator and they enter this catheter and they also with the balloon this is how they look by the ultrasound also two uh, echogenic lines and uh, so total subcutaneous into the bladder and they inflate uh, the balloon and the same as the cystostomy catheter yes uh, also, this is how they look by the x-ray and uh, inside the bladder. Uh, you, if you focus here, also you will find some coils like this patient had also some dilated veins or IV malformation, but also they put uh, a pelvic embolization coils in here. Um, there is a patient who had uh, prosthetic CA, they put what is called radioactive seeds implants, like a small capsules. This is how they look like. And a lot of capsule, they place it in here. And uh, you can see the, how, this is an illustration diagram, how they look like. And by the x-ray, this is how they look like. It's called uh, radioactive seed plant. And each type of, each small capsule would have a radioactive material in case of prostatic cancer. Uh, when you see, it's important to, to make sure that all of these uh, small plants will be in its anatomical position and not one of them will be outside. For example, in this one, there's migration uh, of one of these small seeds. Uh, this patient, he had a uh, seed implant before three years or more, and, uh, and he had, uh, it was asymptomatic, but on the follow-up, they found this migration of one of these seeds plants of radioactive material. Uh, tubal ligation clips, this is how they look like and use it patient with tubal ligation. So if you see these two clips, you should suspect the tubal ligation in patient. This is very also small clips. Uh, also a pissary ring, they place it in the uh, vagina. Uh, this is how they look uh, like. They support the tura especially to prevent uh, uterine prolapse. They look uh, like in the CT. Uh, also at the site of the vagina exactly. Uh, it can be mechanical or sometimes it can be pharmaceutical. Uh, intrauterine device, also I think most of us saw this. This is how they look by the CT and this, this is the normal anatomical location of this. You should see it uh, exactly uh, in the midline pelvis, inferior to the pelvic prim, and uh, this is an expected location. Sometimes they migrate. Yes. Yes, for example, this is, uh, you saw this x-ray and you suspect that this patient also, yani, this is abnormal location. You do a lateral digraph of this patient and you see how posterior it is. So this patient had intrauterine device placement before three years. Uh, despite th that, this patient get pregnant and he, she had a home delivery. Anyway, one year back, they repeat the transabdominal ultrasound uh, for this patient and uh, they found it has, she's complaining from chronic low abdominal pain and and they found that it is located uh, outside the endometrial cavity, more posterior. I think it's uh, at the uh, above the uh, sigmoid colon, very posterior. Also, this patient also had migration uh, and perforation of the IUCD. Now it's located subcutaneously, so exactly beneath the skin. This is how they look like. I think we have a case in our collection, the IUD, I don't know how, but it is in the urinary bladder. It's like it's out of the uterus, somehow perforates the bladder. And I don't know how, Amazing, it's, eh? it's still there in the collection. A uh, type of a stent that is called abdominal aortic stent graph, uh, they paste, put it in patient with aneurysm. So also this is a stent like, and it's a very long placed from the abdominal aorta. Uh, through the two common iliac uh, arteries. Uh, some of them are in the thoracic, some of them will be in the abdominal according to the problem or the site of the aneurysm. This is how they look like and um, exactly this is how they place it and this is how they look by the x-ray. By the CT scan, also this is the stent. Uh, they divide into two, two, two common iliac arteries. Um, with endovascular stent event. Yes. One of the very common board Thank exams you. are the type of leakage yes. of a stent. Just 
I, I will not mention uh, If you want my can talk about now, it. But just uh, everyone should read it and you know the type one, type two, type three, blah, blah, blah. Yes. Uh, you should be uh, able to rem remember it because it's very common on the board exams, the type of uh, endovascular stent leakage. Yes. In short, there are five types. The second type is the most common, uh, sorry, the first type is the most common type. And uh, the leakage will be either uh, how they know it. Uh, they will give contrast to the patient and you by CT you will find the contrast will be passing from outside the stent into here and here. So you should suspect a leak for this patient, for the stent. Also, this is a type of uh, venous stent and have been, um, this patient has a prone and show the stent extending from the left iliac vein into the inferior vena cava, from the left inferior vena can to, uh, vein into the inferior vena cava. This is how the stent look like. Uh, also, this patient have something very important called uh, inferior vena cava filter. Uh, this is how they look like. <coughs> inferior vena cava filter, the patient have repeated uh, venous thrombosis. So they put this like a fork uh, to prevent uh, formation of the thrombus. This is how they look like. No. Okay. The brain formation. Recurrent DVT. DVT of thrombus, yes. Lower limbs. They are afraid from pulmonary embolism. So they just put this in the IVC to catch any emboli that might migrate to the lung. Yes. Uh, so here it is located in the inferior vena cava, and the tip of it will be uh, pointing that there is a filter, inferior vena cava filter. And usually it's above, below the level of the renal vein. The renal vein, yes. So also this patient having uh, this is the proximal portion of your ureteral stent. Uh, also important, we see a lot in CT uh, cases, transjugular intrahepatic uh, portosystemic stunt, uh, stent, so, shunt, sorry. Tips. Uh, uh, yes, uh, tips, and we too, uh, radio opaque or uh, high dense lines will be located at the common bile duct uh, in operative patients. Uh, it will be... Sorry? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, sorry. Uh, sorry, yes. Uh, it will be exactly at the communication between the hepatic and uh, will be, yes, in the treatment of portohepatic uh, hypertension with direct communication between the hepatic vein and the branches of the portal vein, as you said. So it's like a bypass of the liver. Uh, this is how they look like exactly at the site from the portal into the hepatic and then to the uh, vena cava. And of course, you always will see it always in a cirrhotic liver. There must be a cirrhotic liver with portal hypertension and all these things. Okay, so this is the stent, how they look like, and this is how they look like by the x-ray. Uh, this patient had some malposition of the tips. Uh, it have been thrombosed, uh, and the thrombus extending into uh, the right atrium, and also there is occluding also uh, the supermesentic uh, artery, and uh, he's having a dislodgement of it. And also, I think it's uh, yeah, discontinuous. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yes. Uh, also, this patient have important hypertension with ascites. And when they placed this uh, uh, tips, also there was a uh, filling defect they see in the IVC. So there is a failure of this procedure because there is a mural clot with it. Um, uh, this is a type that is called uh, left uh, gastric band. Uh, gastric band, they put in patients who had uh, decreasing of the stomach. So I will talk about uh, it. I think we should maybe stop, stop here, here? and okay. continue next week. Okay. Because it's uh, a different topic. Okay. Okay. Very informative, as usual. Very good, very excellent. I like the book. Any questions, any comments, any. Why it is just a second.